before going back to material, uh, a number of you have asked me about the final exam issues with that just or, or how to study for it. So let me take a few seconds to, to talk about it. Final exam is, will be 60 multiple choice questions. So it will be superficially just like the, the, the midterms except twice as long. You have uh, mostly 180 minutes to, to work on it, which is uh, more than twice as long as you had to work on the, on the midterm. So if history is any guide, there's, there's no one here after three hours. It's more, way more than enough time. Uh, if you're here, you, you came, either came late because you overslept or you're turning wrong, right answers into wrong answers. Um, the way I, a way to think about the, the, way, the, the final exam is it's two midterm exams you know, shuffled together. Sorry, sorry. It's, two, it's two exams of 30 questions each shuffled together. One of those halves is the third midterm, covering material since the second midterm. And the other half of the exam is open season on, an, on anything. So that's sort of how I, how I try to pick out the questions, is so that so I, I cover the last third of the semester with uh, 30 of them, and then the other 30 are anywhere. It's approximate. Uh, to study for them, I do encourage you, as usual, to take the old exams. Again, don't look at the answers. Take them, because it's the thinking is important. The, the process of suffering over trying to find the right answer, trying to identify the wrong answers. Uh, realize that once you find the right answer, assuming I've written the question properly, once you find the right answer, the other three answers must be wrong. Or if you find three wrong answers, the other answer must be right. Um, on extremely rare occasions, I mess up and I have a question that has uh, a right answer and a not so right answer, one that's not truly wrong, but I, but I aim to make the wrong answers just wrong. Okay, so um, be aware that we, we cover different material each year, so that this year I think I actually have covered less material than in many years. So you will find questions, for example, on how metals, uh, the materials work, uh, metals, uh, glass, plastics, rubber, uh, we haven't done that. Um, you may find stuff on medical x-ray stuff that we haven't done either. But so, so be aware that there are, you, you may encounter questions that, that are, where did this come from? We didn't do this this semester. Um, what else? A value to the questions apart from you possibly seeing those questions. And, and, and also, you, you're welcome to go back to the old midterm, the other midterms, too. They're all useful, and I, and I gather ideas from, from all of them myself, including our midterms, one and two. You will probably see questions on the final exam uh, repeated from the midterm. You saw that in the second midterm. I, I repeated questions from the first midterm. Uh, that may happen again. What else here? Oh, uh, even if I don't ask you a specific question, you know, well, a, well, a value from, the, from the, old, the old exams is they give you some idea of what I care about. What's, what, what are sort of the high points of the, of the content as opposed to, to, to the details or things that, that I don't really expect you to ever have retained. These will show you things that I hope that you have, you have learned and will retain. Questions, other things? Nothing else is popping into my head. You okay with the, the idea of the midterm? The final, it's, it is May 7th, Monday, at 9 o'clock. Uh, it'll be Scantron-based, the usual, you, you know, the bubble sheet forms. I guess they're not called Scantrons anymore. And anyway, I do it myself, so it's unofficial altogether. Okay? And I will keep holding office hours until, well, I won't have them Monday afternoon, but that'll be the last time. So, so during, during the finals week, that Wednesday, I'll have morning <coughs> office hours as usual, that sort of thing. All right. So back to content. I just want I I, I do want to on Friday get to nuclear weapons because it's something you ought to know something about. So I'm going to blast through optical communication recording and audio players and, and and hit what I consider the high points of those things that you ought to know. And I talked toward the end of last time or at the end of last time about the the difference between analog representation and digital representation, and I will rehash that briefly. When you're trying to represent something, so in, in effect you're, you're, you're representing, you're, you're, you're 
sucking out the information content of something, sound, video, uh, a table of everybody's phone numbers. When you're trying to represent those, those pieces of, of information, you can do it as, uh, via analog means or digital means. Analog means means that you're taking something, t uh, typically a single physical quantity, like the air pressure in this room, or the variations in air pressure about, about the average, which is to say sound, fluctuations around average air pressure. That is sound. If you're trying to represent that, that one physical quantity, you represent it using one other physical quantity, like the current in a wire, the intensity of a radio wave, um, the level of my hand above the floor. And that's analog representation. It's very simple to do, in concept at least. The problem is it's very susceptible to, to noise issues, and noise is a sort of a catch-all for any sort of thing that messes up your ability, in this case, to observe or measure the, 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 the representing physical quantity, how high my hand is above the floor. In principle, I can represent exquisite detail in the air pressure in this room by exactly how high my hand is above the floor. The problem comes in how, in the, how you can measure that. It's, it's not easy. You, if you, do you actually care about the difference between this and this? You're going to have to get a microscope out and see the difference. And the other thing is, suppose that there are a herd of, again, birds. I'll, I'll send birds through, and you're watching, you're trying to figure out how high my hand is. And in the midst of all this stuff going on, it's hard. Or there's an earthquake. <laughs> my hand's bouncing up. Now, the floor is bouncing up and down, but how are you going to figure out which is which and stuff? So analog representation is inherently uh, susceptible to noise. You can, you can get exquisite detail, 4D digits of, of decimal information about how, uh, uh, what the air pressure is, but you're never, you're never going to be able to observe it. It's, it's, it. I can represent it all I like, you won't be able to figure out. You can maybe get a couple of useful digits of information. In contrast, digital representation uses a stream of, they could be called digits, but instead, I, more generally, I'll call them symbols. And now you can get all the detail you want. If you want to represent the air pressure measurement, about the, the fluctuation about ambient air, air pressure right now, measure the pressure right now to exquisite detail and re represent it as a series of symbols, like decimal digits. Uh, symbols like, you know, there's one, it's a three. So the first digit of the, of the air pressure measurement might be a three, the second digit might be a, a six, third digit might be nine, okay, I didn't have to go. As long as the person observing these, these symbols can distinguish them from each other through, through all the a rainstorm of the, the world bouncing up and down, as long as you can figure it out, you, there's no information lost, exactly none. And so it takes a lot of symbols, and each symbol might be a, a, it might be a physical quantity. So I could do it like, like I'm gonna, if I choose just two symbols, I'm gonna work with, with, I'm gonna work with a set of symbols, and I'm gonna just work with a set of only two. This is a one, and this is a zero. And I go. You can distinguish those perfectly, right? And even if we turned, dimmed the lights and messed up the room, you could still tell this from this. So I can give you a series of symbols, zeros and ones and zeros. And with zeros and ones is the simplest collection of symbols you could ever imagine. It's the binary collection of symbols. You can represent as much information as you like. Uh, it's not unrelated to Morse code, a series of dashes and dots, or smoke signals, series of puffs or no puffs. They're all symbols that, that convey information with no loss. You okay with that idea? Um, if you've ever read The Count of Monte Cristo, there's a part of the plot late in the book hinges on the use of the French semaphore system. To convey information across France, they would use these semaphores, towers separated by vast distances, and they'd be staring at each other with telescopes. And the towers would have arms, veins that would, that would do these various motions. 
You've seen people doing this at, at guiding uh, airplanes in and stuff, or maybe. So the semaphores would convey information as a series of symbols with no loss. Okay, it's not like, yeah, it's no loss. All right, so, so all the digital transactions you ever deal with, and digital rec recording, digital, uh, digital computers, all, they're all working with symbols internally. Those symbols might be currents and wires, or the amount of charge on a, on a capacitor, um, things like that. But it's the same concept, just repeated over and over. So that's digital. So if you want to uh, store music or video, using digital representations of the information. On disks, well, one of the ways you can get the most information on a disk and you can make it in a way that you can mass produce it is with CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray disks. And the way the information is represented on those disks is as patterns of reflective, uh, re patterns in a reflective surface, or actually multiple reflective surfaces. So, if you look at a CD, it's got a, this exquisitely thin layer of aluminum in there. It's thin enough you can see through it if the light behind is bright. And it is not flat. It has all these, the, depending on which surface you look from, it's either divots or dimples. And those are, those are symbols. They're representing digital information. And that's sort of enough to know about it, except um, the reading the writing process involves lasers, but, but you're more aware of the reading process, although, you, yeah, you're more, more aware of the reading process. Again, it uses lasers. Why lasers? Well, because the lasers can be focused onto these little uh, details and consequently observe them, and they're focused with lenses the way you're used to seeing. Uh, you send the light. The light from a, from, from a laser can approximately be thought of as, as you can think, if you think of it in terms of rays, uh, it is in fact a giant wave, which we'll come to. But if you think in terms of rays, you can think of it as coming from very from enormous distance. So the rays are all traveling the same direction, and hence they, they travel these from, from a laser pointer here to the wall without any significant spread. The rays are just keep going straight. That's a little oversimplification, as, oversimplified as we'll see. But the idea is okay. If you take those rays into a converging lens, they begin to bend toward each other, and they meet up somewhere. And because they're all, because it's a single wave, all the photons are the same, they meet up all together, and they make one really bright spot. It's not a point in light, point in space. It's a small, what's called a beam waste. I'll show you that in a second, because of the wave nature of light. But you can, you can really put the light on one of those little features in a CD or a DVD or a Blu-ray. And therefore, see whether, you know, what it looks like, in effect. You, you don't really know, need the full detail. Mostly, they want to know how long the feature is or whether it's there. And that's the symbol representing the information. All right? Uh, why, you know, CD, DVD, Blu-ray, what's going on in the, in the evolution of those? CDs showed up in the, the 80s, or maybe in 1980, give or take. DVDs were later, and Blu-rays were in the past, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. What's the issue here? The, the, the reading process, just to give you a, a, a very brief story of it, the reading process consists of starting with a laser. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a laser diode. We've seen those before. They're, they're using the, the, feature, the characteristic of a diode to the electrons dropping from conduction levels to valence levels, emitting light. They, they allow it to amplify its own light. They put it in a cavity, basically, of mirrors, and they allow it to amplify its light. So you get a, a giant wave coming out of this thing. And the wave, uh, as we'll see, well, I won't, I won't go, why does it spread initially? It spreads initially because it's coming from a small opening. Uh, and waves coming from small openings have to spread. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. It's called diffraction. But anyway, the wave comes out, it's focused, it's, it's, it's played with, it's focused to a tiny spot on that symbol feature, the symbol surface within the, the disk. Uh, it instantly goes, it, it, the spot is bigger before, when it enters the, the plastic, which is why these things are pretty ins relatively insensitive to dirt and crud on the surface. The, the spot of light is big, it, it, it can go around the crud. Even a little crud doesn't cause trouble. A lot of crud does, of course, but they're, they're relatively insensitive to the dirt. 
the, 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 the rays all meet up at one spot inside the plastic on the surface of the, 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 uh, the shiny symbol layer. And it reflects back, and then they observe that light coming back with a diode that is sensitive to light. When light hits the diode, the light, the photons, move charges from the valence level to the conduction level. They put the energy back in, and suddenly the diode can, is able to carry electric current, actually, in this co context, backwards, opposite the direction it normally carries current. The light actually sort of opens the door for charge to go backwards. Anyway, the point is that it, the, you're using a laser to observe that surface. Is that OK so far? Well, why can't you make the symbols on the surface smaller and smaller and put more and more information so you can like put the whole, you know, all the seasons of oranges, the new black on a single disk, OK? Why can't you do that? Well, because they probably get you for copyright violations. But, but apart from that, you can't do it because there's a limit to how small you can make the symbols and still observe them with a laser. And it depends on the frequency and therefore wavelength of the laser. It's due to a phenomenon known as diffraction. When you take a laser beam, so here's my picture of a laser beam, it's traveling along. And you put it into a converging lens. And you're trying to bring the, the you can think of rays initially, you're trying to bring the rays together. The rays, in principle, should meet up at a, at a point in space of no size at all. And that would be great. You can now project all the light from the laser beam onto a symbol as tiny as you like, one atom, for example, or, or half an atom. Okay? But that doesn't actually happen. Why? Because now you're working with, when you get things very small, uh, and it, when in fact, it's the, the wave nature be, of light becomes really important. You're actually dealing not with rays, although rays are a, a, a nice approximation when you're working on, the, on a large scale. You're actually working with a wave. And you're trying to get the ripples in this wave to get, become narrower and narrower and narrower until they're really tiny. And they will not get much smaller than the wavelength of light. You, you have a tough time forming a, a, a spot, what's, it's called a beam waste here, because it doesn't actually get to a point. It gets to a waste, you know, like the waste in, a, in an hourglass. You know, I'll, I'm thinking of uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, the, ah, the famous hourglass, which he throws on the ground. That waste gets to a certain width, and that's it. The size of that waste, it has a little to do with how, well, it had a lot to do with how big the beam was when it went through the lens. Because how, how big the beam was when it went through the lens and the wavelength of the light. Why? Because to put all the light wave into this tiny spot, you need to use constructive interference to build the wave intensity up at that, in that weight, in that narrow spot, and kill it off outside. Just use destructive interference to kill it off everywhere else. Right now, when I'm sending this spot, sending this laser beam on the wall, the spot is small, despite the fact I'm sending a wave across the room, and it, the spot is small because all the pieces of the wave that leave the, out, the output of my laser pointer, you can think of them, the, all these parts of the wave, they're all working together to, to cause constructive interference on beam center and destructive interference everywhere else. And I mean, that may seem like an unnecessary uh, way of thinking about it, but it, it turns out to be important. Because if you start killing off parts of the wave by, by blocking them with something, then it has trouble getting the constructive interference it needs on center to be bright and the destructive interference off center to be dark. You have, you've you've uh, hobbled it. You can't do that. And I can show you this effect. So here we've got a, more, a fancier laser, really. And I'm going to send it through, through pinholes. So this is apropos of your problem set. Um, let me, I'm going to dim the lights. Don't fall asleep. Um, let me go through a, this is a very small hole. Let me go through a, through a big hole first. Uh, it's down here, let's see. I'm going to go, 
So now I'm, le I'm letting the, the, the laser beam go almost unobstructed. That's the whole laser beam, tiny spot, excellent constructive interference on center, and excellent destructive interference off center. But if I start truncating the wave by blocking parts of it, here's half the diameter of the hole, um, it's having a little, not noticeably yet, it's having a little more trouble building the bright spot and, the, and putting dark around it. Here's here, more trouble still. And, and now, I hope most of you can see that. It's, the spot is now, oh, at least the size of a, of a US half dollar. That's the best it can do, having gone through this tiny opening. The wave has been truncated in so many ways that, it, that that's all it's left. It's about the size of a half dollar, and it's got rings around it. We're called airy rings that have to do with, with uh, how the constructive and destructive interference uh, work or don't work. There are there sort of rings of, cons of slightly constructive interference circling the main center. If I get smaller with the hole, the, the spot gets bigger. That's pretty big now. You okay with it? You can see it mostly. Um, if I get, but it's getting dimmer. Can I go further? Let's see. Now that's the big hole again. This was the smallest hole I have up here. That's it. Okay. So this is an effect known as diffract diffraction. When you send a wave through a, 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 a some sort of aperture or, or that blocks parts of the wave, you kill them off, and it can't. It, you, you change its ability to, to cause constructive and destructive interference, and typically it causes spreading of the wave. The, the overall structure gets, uh, expands. You can also think of this in terms of sort of Heisenberg uncertainty, if that's familiar to you at all, the idea that you can't simultaneously know where, where things in our quantum world are located exactly and in which direction they're traveling or, or how fast they're traveling exactly. You can't do them both. They're incompatible in part because of wave effects. And here's a wave effect, too. You can't pin down the location of the laser beam super tightly by sending it to a narrow opening and know exactly which way it's heading, because it won't head purely in one direction. It will spread. And the more you pin it down in, in, in position, the more it spreads in, in, in sort of the, the, the equivalent of, of speed. All right? The consequences of this are, are, are many in our real world. Uh, for the laser beam that's used to read and write information on a CD. Once you try to, to narrow, to, when you try to get constructive interference on center and, no, and destructive interference everywhere else, you're limited. Um, you want to make the beam travel through, uh, essentially come from as big a, a initial structure as possible so that it can, it can work with as many pieces of the wave as possible to create a, a, a tiny spot of constructive interference. So in this drawing up here, you don't want a narrow laser beam like this to start with going through the lens. Because you won't be able to, you don't have enough pieces of the wave here, basically, to get constructive interference at a tiny spot here. Instead, you want to actually expand this laser beam to fill the entire lens. You want to make it wider to start with. It seems counterintuitive. You want to start with the widest laser beam you can and then focus it down. Because now you're working with waves, with parts of the wave coming from this angle and this angle and all these other angles. You've got a much richer palette to work with. And you can get a tinier spot. Is that, you're OK with that idea, I hope, mostly? So in a CD player, and I've got one up here. Can I, let me see. I'll plop it in here and show you the, show you the piece. And yeah, oh, dot the camera. There it is. I'm going to put it on that screen over there and try to remember to go back. Here, it's right here. You see that shiny thing right there? That's, that is the lens. That is the lens that's taking a laser beam and focusing on a CD, which would be here if I put it in. You can see the tray in which it sits. Um, the details here don't matter, apart from that lens is sitting in, it's got uh, coils around it. They're, they're electromagnetic coils, because it's positioned using the same features, the same behavior as a speaker. They run currents through those coils and their magnets around, and the, their forces then move the lens into just the right position. Why do you need just the right position? 
because the lens is trying to hit this very tiny patch of, of symbols on the CD or DVD, and that takes exquisite control, particularly if you're moving this thing around. But the more important point here is they make the lens, that lens, okay, it, it's tiny here up on the screen, that's okay, but it's, it is an extremely high quality lens. They blow up the laser beam to fill the whole lens. And then, so they're working with as many pieces of the wave as possible. That lens is very carefully engineered to pitch the tiniest little beam waves it possibly can onto the symbol inside the CD and observe it. Despite all that effort, now I'll, I'll, I'll stop doing this, they can't make the spot much smaller than the wavelength of light. They're limited by the wave nature of light. You just, it's just, even if you're working with all the waves from all the angles, you can't do it. So if they want to illuminate smaller and smaller symbols, they need to use shorter and shorter wavelengths of light. So in the 80s, they could make uh, little diode lasers in the infrared. You couldn't see the light, but it was there. And that was the light used in CDs. Uh, later on, they could make red light. Uh, laser diodes that would emit red light, they could make small, use smaller symbols, and that's DVDs. And in recent years, they've been able to make blue laser diodes. And therefore, they can work with blue or ultraviolet light, and they can make smaller symbols still, and that's the Blu-ray discs. Is that okay with everybody? So, um, this effect, this, this, this diffraction effect, and I can turn off this laser, um, where, where if, you, if you truncate a wave, you, you limit the, t you make it difficult to, to bring to a small spot. It, believe it or not, that shows up in, 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 uh, in astronomy, in telescopes. Telescopes have gotten bigger and bigger for two reasons. One is because you collect more light, make the telescope huge. Uh, beyond a certain size, you can't make refracting lenses worth anything. It's too, it's too hard. Getting the color corrections and stuff is too hard. So they go to mirrors as the optical elements. And you can make, you can create real images using mirrors. It's, it works just fine. And so they use mirrors, and they collect lots of light with a great big huge mirror. But the other issue is diffraction. That when the wave has been traveling from that star, that tiny wee star over there, it's been traveling for 50, light, you know, 50, 50 million years, and the wave from, from each, of the, each of the waves, they're, they're, they're thermal emissions, so they're, they're in, lots of individual photons, each one for itself, but they have gotten very big with all that travel, and they retain ex wonderful information. The whole wave retains information of where it came from, so in principle, if you could collect the whole wave, you could find where, you could actually look at where on the star it came from. Where that, where that one light wave came, came from. But you can't do that because nobody makes a telescope that big. So instead you make a telescope that's maybe as big as this room. I mean, they're sort of in that category at this point, I guess. And you try to collect a piece of the wave, but you want to collect as big a piece as possible because when you truncate the wave by, by not collecting parts, you limit its ability to be focused tightly and you can't make an image that, that really tells you exactly where the light came from. So the, the limits in, photog in, in astronomy, how, you know, how much detail you can see, the limits are, are, are because of the wave nature of light. You just cannot uh, resolve things that are really close together because you're truncating the light waves and they will create spots that are uh, bigger than you'd like and therefore that overlap a little in space. The same way that spot, when I truncated the wave from the laser, it makes a spot that's this big. And if you have two such spots only separated like this, you can't resolve them anymore. You okay with that? So, you know, some of your money, your, 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 your family's money is being spent on these giant, giant uh, telescopes. A key reason why they have to be so giant is to avoid diffraction limits and to try to get uh, tiny spots and, and resolve details that you couldn't otherwise resolve. All right, so that's, that's optical recording. Let me go on to, do, 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 do. oh, this is, okay. Let me go on to uh, optical communication. And the key point I want to talk about here is the, is, is the transmission of information by way of light. And uh, 
the basic background, of course, is that it's, it's usually digital trans transmission of information. It travels as, as symbols that are light, for example, blinking lights. You know, blinking light, can, can, you can use that to, to transmit Morse code or anything like that. So you can transfer information as light. Uh, if you do it in open air, you're subject to the, all the possibilities. So you can do it in open air. You can send, you know, winking a flashlight at somebody. You've seen a thousand spy movies where somebody's doing this. Blink, 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 sending information. Uh, that's fine as long as it's not foggy. And then you're, you know, you're shot if, 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 uh, if, if, the, if the, you can't see the light. So what do you do? You put the light in an in a environment that's safe, that you can keep it under control. And the classic uh, way to do that is to send the light inside a, a plastic or glass fiber. Well, why would the light travel through the fiber? I mean, for, well, first of all, the fiber better not be opaque. It's got to be trans it's transparent. How transparent? Exquisitely transparent. Because if you're going to send light through a piece of plastic or glass for a mile, uh, it has so many opportunities to be absorbed that that's got to be the clearest plastic or glass you ever saw. You, you've probably seen window glass from the edge on. It looks kind of greenish. Hopefully this is familiar to you guys. It's because ordinary window glass is just not that tr transparent. I mean, it's, it's pretty transparent, but it's not wonderful. It's got a lot of impurities, mostly iron, that give it that, that green tint. And so that's not suitable for communication. You've got to go, go cleaner. And so they've, they've managed to make these unbelievably transparent uh, glasses. Um, plastic, plastic has its limits. You, finally, it's, it's glass, and it's a, it's a quartz glass. It's a very high-tech glass, but it's transparent enough that, it can t that light can go through it for 100 miles with relatively little uh, loss. But the other thing is, okay, so you send the light into a, into a piece of glass. How do, you, how do you keep it in the glass? Why, don't you, why doesn't it just leak out the sides? Light doesn't go dead straight. Um, I mean, it does, the ray idea does, but the waves don't really go that straight. They, they have some spreading character. How do, you, how do you trap it? And the way you trap it is by way of what's called total internal reflection. And the concept here is that if, if you've got glass or plastic here on the left, in which light travels slowly, and you have air over on the right side where, in which light travels fast. When light tries to move from, from the, the high index material to the low index material, and remember, refractive index is a measure of how much light slows down in the material. So when you go from, from high index, that is travel slow, to low index, which is travel fast, it bends away from the perpendicular. Remember that idea? So if light was traveling totally, totally uh, along the perpendicular, it continues on the perpendicular. But if it was, if it was traveling at, a, at a, some angle to perpendicular, it bends away from the perpendicular. And as the, as the angle at which it, it in, uh, encounters that surface gets shallower and shallower, it bends more and more until finally it bends so far it doesn't get out at all. It bends beyond 90 degrees. I mean, the mathematics is sort of quirky. It just it, it gets to a 90 degree angle, and then it 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 the equation just changes character. It actually be, becomes complex, which is beyond what we need to talk about. But anyway, the reflection is perfect. It's not 99 percent. It's 100 percent to all the digits. No light, in principle, gets out beyond a very shallow distance beyond that surface. And this is true not only in, in the world of 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 ray optics, but in, in wave optics. The wave just does not get out. And so, wow, you get a perfect reflection off that surface. If you then have the light traveling at a shallow angle through a cylinder of, of glass or plastic, it keeps bouncing off the surfaces as long as it hits them at shallow angles. And so you can get these situations where the light goes all the way through. Make it so, ah, so you can see it. Can you, can you see the lights coming out the other end? Is that okay? Uh, ways in which I can, I've got a whole slew of, of demonstrations, demonstrations like this. This is the basis for what are known as fiber optics. The light goes into the fiber from, from the end, and it skittles back and forth across the sides of the, of the core, of, of the high index core, like plastic or glass, and never gets out because it reflects perfectly off the surfaces every time. And some cases where you can see that, um, 
I can send this laser pointer in to this piece of plastic, and it will skittle back and forth across the, the walls and get all the way to the bottom. Oh, it's, it's over here. I'm backwards. There's, there's, can you see it? You're seeing it. It's, it's, it's arcing around here. It's coming down, and, it, and it's hitting the ground. Somewhere down here. It, it, you're seeing it only because the surface is so dirty that sometimes the light manages to go from plastic, not into air, but into, into crud. And once it gets into the crud, and the crud has an index of refraction similar to the, to the plastic, so the, so the transition isn't a problem. It doesn't, get, doesn't do total internal reflection there. It leaks out. And once it gets into the crud, it, the crud is all randomly misshapen. The light hits it at a non-shallow angle and busts free. So that's why you're seeing it. Can, can you see the swirling light going all the way around the loop? loop? Um, you've seen these toys. Th these are fiber optics. The light is entering these fibers, skittling back and forth across them, and coming out the tips. And it'll, you know, it's lots of fun. Um, <laughs> that's so super useful, who knows? Um, these are more fibers. I'm going to send the light in over here, and you can see, because I'm, I'm using a laser, I can, send them, I can pick out which fiber I want the light to go into, and therefore which one it comes out. But it's, rad, it's traveling all the way through this. Do, 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 having fun. All right. Uh, what else? Uh oh, this one. This is a sound. We've got an audio source here, which I'll start. Do, 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 I think. Yeah. And this is a, a transmitter. This transmits analog sound information. It's representing the sound as fluctuating intensity of the light. So it's not, it's not digital representation. It's analog, but it works anyway. This, do I have this going here? So this is sending light that's varying in intensity. It's going through this fiber, this plastic fiber, over to here. And if I take the plastic fiber out, you can, see, can you see the red light? That's the sound information coming along. And when I put it back in, OK? So clearly, you can send information as a fiber, as a light in a fiber, and it will follow a very, fiber for a long way. It's, it's, you know, it's, by the time it gets here, it's bounced 1,000 times, or 10,000 times, a whole slew. I can stop this. OK. Any questions about the idea of the fiber optic then, the basic idea? OK. Um, oh, oh, one more demonstration is, is you can send light through a, a, a fiber of water. I get this. Is this going to work for me? What? Doesn't look right. Where's the light? No light. Can you see the light on my hand? So the, the light is there. There, that's better. It's a little. This is a little ratty. I should do better. But the light is, is skittling back and forth inside the, the channel of water. All right. I'll stop. Um, the details of how real fibers work. These, the fibers I've shown you so far, they're all pretty primitive. The transition between the fiber, the, the pla it's, they're all plastic, actually, or water. And they go from the plastic or water to air. And they work nicely as long as that surface is completely clean. Nobody's bothering it. But they're pretty susceptible to, to, to junk. So what do you do? Well, don't you, don't, don't expect air to be the, the low index surface off which the light reflects perfectly. Put a second surface there. Do it, do it deliberately. And so so sophisticated fiber optics, the ones that actually carry your internet or anything like that, they are made of two, approximately two different glasses. One of them is exquisitely, they're both tr exquisitely transparent. One of them is the core, and, and it has the high index of refraction. Light travels slowly in it. And the outside is the cladding, which is a second material. Light is not supposed to travel through the cladding. The point of the cladding is to make sure the light, when it hits the transition from one to the other, it reflects perfectly. So the cladding is outside there, and it protects the, the whole structure from sh the, the junk on the outside. OK? So water, your hands, whatever's out there. So the light, in the simplest form, you send in a, 
light, and maybe you send it as a series of pulses. You're basically doing Morse code. You send the light in. It, it, each time it, and you, it, it comes in from the end, so it's traveling at a shallow angle when it, when it encounters the interface between the core and the cladding, and it bounces by way of total internal reflection. It does it perfectly, it, you know, essentially no loss in this system. Back and forth and back and forth, and it comes out at the end. That's the simplest type of fiber. It's just called a multi-mode fi fiber. Why is it multi-mode? It's because you've given the light opportunities to travel at different angles. Uh, it can bounce back and forth at a whole variety of angles in, according to the ray notion of light. In fact, in the wave notion of light, it's, it, it's a little more limited. But still, it can bounce at many angles, and therefore, different parts of the light can travel different distances be between entry and exit. And the consequence of that is that if you send pulses of light that are the symbols representing information, they go in as very short pulses, and they come out longer. Because some, some parts of the pulse travel farther than others to, before they get out. You OK? Any questions at this point? Um, Multimode fibers are great for local communication. Uh, I'm, I, this fiber, for example, is a multimode fiber. They're, they're, the light can go in at different angles and come out just fine. And it's, it's, you're not going to be able to transmit uh, your, your gigabit internet or something like that. It's gonna, it'll work in, on this, these distances, but it won't work across town. So what do you do? Well, you can do a little better by not having a sharp interface between the core and the cladding. You use a gradient. They, they, they allow different chemicals to, to, to meander through the material, and they create a, a gradual transition from, from high index where the light travels slow on center to a low index where the light travels faster in the cladding. And the paths the light travel are a little curvy, and they get a, a narrower pulse. The, the, the travel time between all the possible paths through the core are not that different. You get, you get a better. You, you get uh, better transmission uh, fidelity. You get, you get the pulse in and the pulse out are not that different. But you can do better still, and this is where what, what all the long haul internet uh, uses. And, and if you're sending information to, to Chicago or to Tokyo, this is what you use. They use what are called single mode fibers. In a single mode fiber, the core is extremely narrow a few microns, that is a few millionths of a meter. It's tiny, you can't see it with your eye. Thinner than a hair. And there is only one path through it for the wave. In the, in, in the wave picture of light, which finally is the real picture, there is only one way the wave can travel through this, this core. Uh, it's a single mode of, of, of transmission. And the pulses in and the pulses out are, to this extent, identical. There is no one path. They all go the same distance. So, so you can transmit the most information per second through a single mode fiber. It's harder to work with because you have to get the laser into this, the laser beam into a, 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 the end of this tiny fiber. So this is why it's all the big bucks. But, but, it, but that's the idea. Is it OK? Last details about this. So, so your internet is going as light waves. They, they come out of laser. Di uh, Laser diodes, primarily, I think, uh, are able to blink on and off really fast if, you're, if done properly. And this is a lot of engineering and development to get really fast. So you blink them on and off 50 billion times a second, that kind of stuff. And then you get exquisitely fast sensors that can watch the blinking on and off like that. Uh, you want to pack as much data as you want because you know, somebody wants to stream the entire season of Pick Your Favorite Show uh, tonight. You know, they're, they're binging, and they're in Europe, and they want to get it from the US, legal or otherwise. You know, there's a lot of data going across. So you want to pack those little uh, digital symbols as tightly as you possibly can. So they use single mode fibers. Um, there's some things they got to deal with. First off, the, the, the fibers aren't perfectly um, uh, transparent. They lose a little bit of intensity with the mi as the miles rack up. So if you want to, if you want to talk to Paris, send your data to Paris, you actually have to uh, build up extra light uh, along the way. You can't send it all in at the beginning. You, you send it in as bright as you can at the beginning, but you've got to amplify it en route. And they actually introduce into the fibers laser amplifiers every, every so often along the path between here and Europe. There are laser amplifiers in the fiber that take the light that's coming in 
and take the, this one giant wave and boost its intensity, make it brighter. So, um, you know, it's a whole technology to do that. That's one thing. Second thing is that I have neglected dispersion. Remember dispersion? The bluer, things, bluer light travels slower than redder light. Well, when you start pulsing the light, it's not a single frequency anymore. Just like with AM and FM modulation, when you start putting information on your radio wave, it's not a single frequency anymore. So these pulses actually uh, have, have some bandwidth to them. They have, they have a higher frequency end and a lower frequency end, and the, the lower frequency end travels a little faster than the higher frequency end. They get slurped out, and the pulse gets slurped out because of dispersion as it goes 3,000 miles across the ocean, under the ocean. So they have to deal with that, and a way they deal with that is they find, for the core, they find the, frequ the, the range and frequencies in which the dispersion is the weakest. And it's in the infrared most fibers. So they, they, the, the long-haul fibers are carrying symbols as infrared light in, in, in around the, the dispersion minimum of these fibers. And that's most of the story of fibers. Anything else I want to say with this? Have I done all my demonstrations? I think so. So you okay with, with uh, transmission of information by fibers, as light and fibers? Do I have anything else? I, something else is going through my head to talk about. Blah, 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 blah. Nope. Uh, oh, yes, I, did, I, I actually did want to, because I want next time not to talk just about this, I, I'm going to bring up something completely different really fast. And audio players would have been the next topic. I'm going to just lobotomize it. And I want to talk about a device, the, the key device in all computer stuff currently. It's called an MOS FET transistor, which, where the last letter, the T in the, that is transistor. It's called a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. It's a, it's a, it starts essentially as two diodes. Remember diodes? Uh, two, or sorry, they say two PN junctions. It's made of three pieces of semiconductor. In this case, it consists of a P-type semiconductor in the middle and two N-type semiconductors on the, on the ends. When you touch that collection together, as with the PN junction, electrons migrate across the, 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 the boundary between those the, across the junction, they leave the conduction levels of the n-type material and fill in the valence levels of the p-type material. So when you assemble this thing, you end up with a big depletion region where all the valence levels are filled and all the conduction levels are empty. This looks like a total disaster. It can't do anything. It can't conduct electricity. It's hopeless. The interesting thing, though, is this has a gate on it. It has an electrically chargeable surface separated by an insulator that can do things. You can put charge on this. And if you put positive charge on this surface, which is it's a conducting surface, so it's, a, it's a, like a metal. If you put positive charge on there, it can attract electrons into the depletion region and begin to fill up the conduction levels. And when that happens, this thing goes from being a completely hopeless non-conductor to a conductor. And so here's a picture of it with conducting. You put positive charge in there, suddenly you, you can have electrons in the conduction levels attracted by the, the gate, and it conducts electricity. So this is a field effect. The electric field from the charge turns this thing on and off and everything in between. And it's exquisitely sensitive to charge, and that's the last thing I'll show you. I'll, I've got one up here. And we'll look at it from above on the side camera. There it is. It's, it's this device here. And let me get some voltage here. Right now, I'm putting, it's not conducting electricity. I have four volts, that's four up here, between source and drain, it's called. The two ends, these are source and drain, doesn't matter. And there's the gate electrode doing nothing. If I put positive charge on that gate electrode, it will become, the, the, this guy will become a conductor, and it won't have a voltage drop anymore. Well, how am I going to put positive charge on it? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm going to take positive charge off the, the positive wire here and put it on with my finger. Not very compelling. Let me, can I get this better? Oh.
oh, oh, here, you can see the current flow. That's probably a better indication. I, I'm, current on. Oh, this is not very compelling at all. Give it one more second. I, at the beginning of next time, I'll do it better. The point I'm trying to make here, which, you know, which I'm not getting because I'm probably screwing it up, is the charge that goes through my hands is enough to turn this thing on and off. So tiny amounts of electric charge can, 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 can control the flow of current across some powerful thing. This is the basis of all your computer stuff, all your like, modern electrons. They're all filled with these field effect transistors. Um, and digital memory, all you know, the active memory in your computer, it's all based on this transistor. And I'll, I'll do it right on Friday and then get on to nuclear weapons. <laughs>